Everyone, today we're looking at this idea of charges moving in magnetic fields and the forces that they feel. Since the magnetic force is always perpendicular to the field and the velocity, what's going to happen is if you look at that charge moving there, you can see there is a force upwards. If you do your right hand roll, fingers in the direction of velocity, curl in the direction of the magnetic field that's into the page, and you get a force upwards. That's going to force that charge to move right to here. But remember, things want to move in straight lines. So since they want to move in straight lines, you can do your right hand rule again, and V cross B gives you a force in towards the center of the circle. So then that means that charge will move up here. And the charge doesn't want to go in a circle, it wants to go in a straight line, but the magnetic force keeps forcing it inwards. So no matter where it goes, you've got an inward pulling force in all directions which means that the magnetic force here ends up being a centripetal force. And if we just switch the charge, then you'd have to use your left hand, and if this was a negative down here, that charge would arc in the opposite direction. So let's do a quick example problem to show you how you can solve for things with centripetal forces and magnetic forces. Let's say that that charge is a proton, so we should be able to look up the mass of a proton. It's on your equation sheet. We know the charge of a proton is the positive of the electron charge, 1.6 to the negative 19. Uh, let's say that this radius here is 21 centimeters, and it's in a magnetic field that is 0.4 teslas. So we know a lot of information. The question would be, well, how fast is this charge moving? How long does it take to go around the circle? All of those things could be asked. The first thing we want to say is that yes, the magnetic force is equal to your centripetal force, which means that QVB equals MV squared over R. Well, you can see there's a velocity here and a velocity there. We can get rid of those. If I want to solve for velocity, I can just rearrange my equation a little bit and get Q, B, R over M. And all four of those things are the things I gave you right at the beginning. The mass of the proton, the electron charge, the magnetic field strength, and the radius. So go ahead and work out that problem. So I get about 8.05 times 10 to the 6th meters per second. So it's still legal. It's below the speed of light, so it's moving very quickly. And that's why I can create the radius that it does. So we also talked today about all the different ratios, like what would happen if you'd increase the magnetic field strength? What would happen if you change the amount of charge or change the mass? How would the speeds change? How would the radiuses change? And you can play with all those ratios just because we know this relationship. But what about the time? How do you figure out the time for something to go around a circle? Well, since this brought us back to circular motion, we know that the speed to go around a circle is just your distance, which is 2 pi r over t. So I could put this velocity in here and solve for time. When you do that, you get, so the time for something to orbit in a magnetic field is equal to two at pi m q times the magnetic field strength, which means that it's independent of your speed. It doesn't matter how fast you're going, the time it takes you to go around that circle is just based on this ratio. But what if we wanna know how many spins you'd make per second? Well, frequency, remember, is the inverse of time so we're going to do 1 over the time period and just flip that ratio. You get QB over 2 pi m. So using the values we had before, we can see that if you put in for your time period, you get around 164 nanoseconds. And if you want to know how many spins you make per second, that's 1 over the time period. And you get about 6.1 million hertz. You orbit in that circle about 6.1 million times per second. We have a very small charge moving very quickly and it's allowed to zip around that circle at these frequencies and in these time periods. And this is what we see in these experiments here. We can fire electron beams into magnetic fields and we see these arcs. Depending on the mass of the charge or how fast those charges are going will depend on how big the arcs are. So what this video is showing here is a beam of electrons that are moving in a magnetic field. And you can see that they do arc into a circular pattern and all they're doing here to make that circle smaller is increasing the magnetic field strength. The stronger the field, the tighter the force, and the tighter the loop of charge that it makes. So what happens if we have a charge moving at an angle across a magnetic field? Well, let's say our magnetic field here is in the I direction, and our velocity is in the I and J direction if we go at an angle. Well, the velocity in the I direction is not going to be affected by the magnetic field because they're parallel to each other. So the only one that does affect it is the velocity that is going perpendicular to that field. The horizontal x speed is going to remain constant, but the y speed is going to cause the centripetal force. So the charge is going to go in a circle, 
but the whole circle is going to shift. And if you keep that going, you create this helix shape as the charge moves through the magnetic field. So this is what that picture is showing here. You have a charge moving in a magnetic field, it's moving at an angle and creates these helix shapes, and that's what the picture is showing you. If you kind of expand that magnetic field right in the middle there, what you can actually create is what we call a magnetic bottle, where you have a charge that feels a force inwards on the two ends, but then creates that centripetal force right there in the middle. So the charge will oscillate back and forth and back and forth and is trapped in this magnetic field and can't leave. They use this for fusion experiments where they're trying to contain plasmas and charges in these kind of magnetic bottles so that they can try to create those fusion reactions. So another application of using magnetic fields is something we call the velocity selector. And we play with this today. So what's the point of the velocity selector? Well, in a velocity selector, you fire charges into it and there's an electric field from those two plates. The electric field, since this is a positive charge moving, you can see it creates a force downward. That means that up here we've got positive charges and down here we have negative charges, creating an electric field straight down and creating an electric force. But what we want to do is make sure that we can maintain a straight line motion through this selector so that anything going through this will go at one particular speed. Well, to deflect that charge upwards and create an upward force, you see a velocity, we can increase a magnetic field on this charge. So if I turn on a magnetic field, now you can see there's a blue arrow represent magnetic field force. So if you do the V cross the magnetic field into the page, you get an upward magnetic force. I'm still not perfectly on that line, so let's increase the electric field strength. Increasing the electric field strength makes the electric force a little bit stronger, and now any charge that enters this magnetic field and electric field that are crossed passes straight on through with a particular speed. So that means that the force from the electric field and the force from the magnetic field must be equal. So QVB must equal Q times E, the electric field, and it means that the velocity that is going through there doesn't depend on charge. The velocity only cares about two things, the electric field strength divided by the magnetic field strength. You know those two things and check your units, you should get meters per second in the end. So we've got the selector. What does it do? What, what does it matter? Well, if you can accelerate that charge through a potential difference, that's the first thing, you've got to get that charge up to speed. Once it hits the selector, if it's going the correct speed, it passes straight through. But if that velocity is too high, then the magnetic force is too high and you see the charges arc and they don't actually enter a detector. If your charge is moving too slow, the electric force takes over and you get an arc down and you still miss and don't enter the detector. So you need to be going the right speed, which is why it selects the speeds that you want to go through selector into the actual detector. What is the detector on the other end? We call it a mass spectrometer. So you can see there's an ion source that accelerates the charges, they go through the velocity selector, and then they hit a region of magnetic field. Those charges, once they hit the magnetic field, feel centripetal forces. So everything we talked about right at the beginning of this video are the forces that the charges feel, and those charges arc and hit a screen. What we can measure from where the charges enter to where the charges hit is the distance they travel, which if you look at that semicircle, is the diameter. And since we know a relationship between speed, charge, magnetic field strength, radius, and mass, well, everyone coming into the detector here is going the same speed. We charge all those particles to the same charge, and they're all experiencing the same magnetic field strength. So all that's going to be different here is that if you get a different radius for one of the charges, you actually have a different mass, and you can solve for different isotopes that pass right through the mass spectrometer. So they go through this deflection area, and the further they get deflected, the heavier the mass. Because if you think about it, the heavier the mass, the more it wants to maintain straight line motion, and the harder the magnetic field needs to work to try and arc it. Lighter masses will make small arcs, and heavy masses will make big arcs. So you can see if I fire lead into the mass spectrometer here, I get 64 centimeters of distance that it got deflected. Remember that is the diameter, not the radius. If I reset this and fire a heavier isotope of lead, you can see my radius increases ever so slightly. 
if we get a larger atom, let's say uranium-238, you can see the radius increases even more. And if I got plutonium here, the heaviest one in this setup, I get the largest radius. So just by looking at the arcs of those subatomic particles, I can actually figure out or which isotopes are present in a sample. If I want to change those setups, I can change the magnetic field strength. So I can make the magnetic field stronger, which would make tighter loops. Or I could go ahead and up the speeds. So if I up the speeds for the uranium, you can see I get a much different radius based on my current setup. Or 0.955 Teslas and 2 10 to the fifth on my meters per second here. Here's the mass of that charged particle. So double check and see if you get the same radius that the simulator did. Which brings us to our last application of the use of magnetic fields. And this is called a cyclotron. A cyclotron is really just a particle accelerator. What happens is you have alternating voltage on both ends of those plates. So if you look at a charge from a side view, it has one plate positive and one plate negative. So the plates have a voltage across them, which accelerates the charge from one plate to the next. The charge is allowed to enter that other D, and what they experience is a magnetic field only in those regions. So when that charge enters one of the Ds, it feels a centripetal force and arcs its way back around. But when it hits the plate, since we have an alternating voltage here, the plate, by the time it reaches the midpoint, has switched its polarity and made one side positive and the other side negative. So that charge then feels an acceleration again and picks up more speed. So it enters the magnetic field with a larger speed. The larger the speed creates a larger arc. And again, by the time it gets back to those plates again, the plates have already switched their charge. So the charge then feels an acceleration again. And you get more arcing. And this will happen again and again and again. And so you see at the very, very end, it gets to the last D and there's a hole. What you've done is you've accelerated that charge to very, very high speeds. And now you can launch that speed into a detector. So they do this at the Large Hadron Collider. And they also do this at Fermi Labs where they have particle accelerators. They take charges, get them up to close to the speed of light. And they have two of these. They have a second one that sends charges in the opposite direction. And when those charges meet, they collide and smash into each other, trying to create even smaller subatomic particles. All the quarks and bosons that were there present in the early universe. So again, the nice thing about this, remember, since it is circular motion, as you go through each of those Ds, we know that we can solve for the velocities based on Q, B, R over M. So the mass of the charge doesn't change, the sign of the charge doesn't change, the magnetic field doesn't change, the radius keeps changing because the speed keeps changing. If I want to know the energy that's associated with those charges once they leave, well, we could solve for the kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is easy. It's one half mv squared, which would be all that velocity equation we have above. So it'd be q squared, b squared, r squared, all over m squared. And the nice thing is the only thing that cancels out here is one of the masses. So that would be the kinetic energy of these particles once they leave the particle accelerator. Also, if we go back to the time for this thing to orbit around here, remember the time is independent of the speed. It doesn't matter how fast you're going. So once they know the time period and frequency for those charges to move around, you know exactly what rate to change the voltage on these two leads. So if the frequency, like our first problem, was 6.1 million times a second, then you switch those voltages at that particular rate, and you can accelerate those charges to really, really high speeds. So I'll leave a link here to show you exactly how a particle accelerator works and how the Large Hadron Collider works at CERNs in Switzerland or Fermilab here in the United States. So enjoy the video and we'll talk next time.